I would like to greet all of you. A very pleasant good afternoon. Good afternoon. And especially those in communion with us in the celebration of this wonderful feast of divine mercy. A feast that was actually instituted or decreed by St. John Paul II during the canonization of St. Faustina in April 30, the year 2000. And St. Faustina has been called since then the Apostle of Divine Mercy. But my dear brothers and sisters, in order to understand better this wonderful Feast of Divine Mercy, let us enter into the beautiful gospel we heard from the Gospel of St. John. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, the Gospel of John is considered the Gospel of Faith in the same manner that the Gospel of Luke is called the Gospel of Mercy. You know? In the Gospel of John, in the various encounters of Jesus in his teachings, most especially during his miracles, all these encounters would always end up with a question, do you believe? Do you believe in the one whom the Father has sent? Do you believe in the one who is now teaching you? Do you believe in the one doing all these miracles to make you aware that God's kingship is now? And even in today's gospel, it ends by invitation to believe. When Jesus says, Blessed are those who haven't seen, yet believe. For them, life, to them, life will be given. So belief is crucial so that we may experience life eternal. In the Gospel of John, explicitly he said, This is eternal salvation, that we believe in the one whom the Father has sent. But my dear brothers and sisters, before we come into this wonderful encounter of Jesus with Thomas, you know, we used to call him Doubting Thomas, but actually Thomas was a brave apostle. Remember, before going to Jerusalem, when he was, uh, Jesus was already being threatened, Thomas said, let us go and die with him. So Thomas must have a deep faith and believe on the person of Jesus and what he stands for, that he is ready and willing to die for Jesus. So Thomas is not a weakling. No? Thomas is not a weakling. He may have failed momentarily or temporarily, but he would show again his humility and his power by humbly proclaiming, my Lord and my God. And to proclaim Jesus, as one's Lord and God, especially during these times of persecution, you know, involves tremendous faith, tremendous courage. My dear brothers and sisters, in the first part of this gospel, we're told that Jesus appeared before the disciples who were hiding, who were in fear and trembling. All of a sudden, Jesus stood in the midst of them and gently said, Peace be with you. Do you know, my brothers and sisters, peace is the first gift of the, rest of, of the risen Christ to his church, to all of us, to his first disciples. Remember, as I said, they were in fear and trembling. Now Jesus wants to comfort them by giving them the gift of peace. But not only that, he would give another gift, and that is the gift of the Spirit. He promised them that He will give them the Holy Spirit, who will capacitate them, give them the power to forgive sins. Another gift to the church, to the power of the Holy Spirit. The church would become the venue, the bridge of conciliation before God and sinful men. And another beautiful gift Jesus is giving to his disciples and to the church, the gift of mission. Go, 
Go and proclaim the good news to others. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead, it was not just to prove that what he said was true, real. Or his reason being risen from the dead is not just the fulfillment of all the promises in the Old Testament. Jesus continues to give many gifts to his new community to strengthen them, to enliven them, and above all, above all, to make them a lighthouse that will show and manifest that indeed Jesus is the light of the world. And you know, my brothers and sisters, these four gifts I mentioned of peace, Holy Spirit, forgiveness for sins, the gift of missions, they're all encompassed in the beautiful gift Jesus gave to the church on Easter, and that is His mercy, divine mercy. We can never understand the Bible without mercy, without love, and without mercy. Love and mercy, these are the main attributes of our living God. He's a God merciful compassionate to his people to us whom we created in his image and likeness we are so precious to god our father that he sent jesus to us to forgive us of our sins to save us and ultimately to be with him in eternity in his kingdom saint john paul ii wrote a beautiful encyclical the second encyclical entitled Divis in Misericordia, Riches in Mercy. Wherein he speaks to us of mercy in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm not going to lecture about that here. You know, I'm limited in time. But Pope St. John Paul II was saying that the content, yung laman, the content of divine intimacy is mercy. When we relate ourselves with God in an intimate relationship, you know, what binds us to God is mercy. Mercy is the door that opens our relationship with God. And not only that, St. John Paul II repeats by saying, the content of our dialogue with God is always characterized by mercy. When God speaks to us and when we speak to Him in prayer, God looks, us, uh, looks at us with, an, uh, with eyes full of mercy, compassion, and fatherly love. And such mercy, my dear brothers and sisters, finds its epitome, its fullness, especially in the parable of the prodigal son. Some are saying it should be called the parable of the merciful Father. Mercy, divine mercy, is peace. St. Faustina says, Humanity can never find true peace until it turns with trust to Jesus, to divine mercy. It is only when we are basking in the mercy of the Lord that we can truly and deeply experience mercy. But you know, my dear brothers and sisters, mercy is not something that simply falls from the earth, although Shakespeare says that. The quality of mercy is that strain. It falls like a gentle rain from heaven. God provides us His mercy, most especially when He sees us with hearts contrite and sorrowful. People are no longer merciful or people even forget the meaning of mercy or the reality of mercy because they have become so self-secured, self-satisfied. They're saying, I am independent. I can stand on my own. I don't need mercy. And most especially when they're not aware of the reality of sin in their lives. Mercy is mercy. Mercy is God's gift to heal us, to make us once again whole because sin breaks us, 
destroys us, shatters us. And God, the divine physician, provides us the healing touch of mercy to put us back together again, whole and pleasing in His sight. My dear brothers and sisters, how can we ever remind ourselves, or how can we remind ourselves of this very important teaching of our faith? Let us not forget that mercy in our Catholic or Christian faith is not an idea. It is not a philosophy. No. It is the personification of the Father's love and compassion to humankind. Personification in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the living compassion, mercy, and love of the Father to humankind. So the first act we have to do is to stay close to Jesus. Therefore, stay close to Jesus would mean aware of our sinfulness, our weakness, our negativities, our difficulties. We ask Jesus to have mercy on us. We plead Jesus to forgive us. Like so many people in the New Testament would cry, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. We should never tire every day to be saying that. Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Bible even says, even the just man falls seven times a day. So before we go to bed, let us see to it that those words would come out of our lips, springing from our hearts. Jesus, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. Ask for mercy. Second, be merciful yourself. Jesus teaching the early disciples in the Beatitude says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We should be channels of God's mercy. We should be ready to be merciful, to be forgiving, to be understanding. We should be ready to raise up those who have fallen, to heal, and to forgive those who have hurt us. We should be ready to say, Come, let's have a fresh start in friendship and love and in divine mercy. I remember a story of an American pilot who crashed landed in the sea. He was the only one who survived, and for 47 days, the longest at the time who survived on the sea alone until his rubber boat docked or was uh, led to the Marshall Islands and he was captured by the Japanese. He was sent to Japan and together with other American prisoners of war, they were really badly, terribly treated, especially by this sergeant called Watanabe, whom the prisoners would call the bird. He was so brutal in really make the prisoners of war suffer a lot through beatings, lashings, so forth and so on. Until during the liberation, this American soldier named Louis Zamperini, who was also a track field uh, runner in the Olympics, you know, went back to the States, a hero, and then he was able to, to his wife, able to enter the more deeply into his faith. So he took his faith seriously, embraced his faith deeply, and really took the teachings of Christ, especially mercy and forgiveness, unto his heart. And so he pledged that he would be a man of forgiveness and that the way to move forward is not through revenge, but through forgiveness. So he went back to Japan. He went back to Japan and he was able to meet some of the soldiers who treated them severely and harshly. And he told them that he's forgiving them. He has forgotten everything except for the bird. The bird, Watanabe, would not like to meet him. So he wrote a letter to this brutal soldier, this, this beast, this bird, you know, telling Watanabe that he has forgiven him. That Louis Zamparelli has forgiven him. 
Nobody knows what happened to the letter, whether Watanabe even read it or not. Nobody knows. But Sir Pareni went back home at peace because he was able to share God's mercy and the gift of forgiveness. And his dream of running again in the Olympics came into fruition when in 1990, he was the one who held the torch and ran through the Oval in Tokyo, Japan, fulfilling his dream. Not just to run at the Olympics, but most especially to forgive those who have hurt him. And he died at the age of 83. So we should be vehicles of mercy. I know at times it's easier said than done. No. We may want to forgive in the mind, but it's hard to forgive in the heart. But Jesus says, when you forgive, forgive from the heart. Unless you forgive from the heart, your Father will not forgive you. And finally, let us find confidence, trust in Jesus. Jesus was sent to save us, to embrace us, and to lead us to the Father. That is the mission of Jesus. I have come not to condemn, not to judge, but to show the way to salvation. I conclude, my dear brothers and sisters, by offering to you the word mercy as an acronym. And what does it mean? Mercy, spelled M-E-R-C-Y. The M-E, make efforts. Make efforts. R-C-Y, renew Christ in yourself. That is what mercy is all about. Day by day, we make efforts to renew our Christian faith in Jesus. In, our, in the deepest deep of our being. When we do that, my dear brothers and sisters, mercy for us would not just be a word, either from the dictionary or from the Bible, but we would be participating in the personification of divine mercy through our faith and love of Jesus and His Church. Amen.